Massa. Ma, 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 ma. Doesn't matter how little, how great, how small. The scripture says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Yes, sir. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Put it all in his hands. My God. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. My God. Amen. Oh, amen. My God, my God. Now, now y'all know I don't, I don't do this much, but it's something in my heart. Y'all work with me. Y'all work with me, all right? When I think about Jesus and what he's done for me, when I think about Jesus and how he set me free, I'm a dance, 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 dance all night. My, 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 all night. When I think about Jesus and how he set me free, when I think about Jesus and what he's done for me, I'm a dance, 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 dance. All night, 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 all night. When I think about Jesus and what he's done for me, when I think about Jesus and how he set me free, I'm a dance, 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 all night. My God! Hey! Hey! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Glory! Glory! Glory, my God. Woo. Glory, 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 glory. Amen. 
Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Well, thank you, man. My Lord, my Lord. Woo. My Lord. Amen. Amen. An interruption from our sponsor. <laughs> Amen. Put it all in his hands. I, I feel, I feel, I feel like saying, I feel like saying now unto him. <laughs> That is evil. <laughs> no, I can't. It can't go there because of my responsibility. Y'all feel a little better now? Yeah. Amen. So do I. Amen. So do I. So do I. Whew. We are. Uh, what we've been talking about? No, we've been talking about. We've been talking about in the book of First John this whole issue about spiritual growth, spiritual development, and it's vital. It's crucial that we do that is because God has given us everything we need to mature, to grow. And let's not get it twisted that God expects for every one of his children to grow. Now let me qualify that further explanation of the spiritual development and that is you just don't or you can't become spiritually developed the level of maturity without going to the process of developing. Otherwise, some may think in their minds that they can become mature overnight. And what the scripture does is that it takes a natural thing, a natural experience, an actual natural um, thing that we are accustomed to, to explain a deeper thing that God expects for us to be like, to act like, to do like. The scriptures are full of it, and I'm not going through all of them because It'll take away from what we are assigned to do this morning. But just know that God uses natural metaphors that all of us are accustomed to and that all of us can relate to. To embellish it for spiritual edification and the furtherance of our maturation. Like John 15, I am the true vine, you are the branches. See, that's a metaphor. Branches, vine. He's the vine, we're like the branches. Talks about what he does and it talks about what we ought to do. 
metaphor. Paul uses it and 1 Corinthians 9 explaining to the Corinthian believers about this issue of them sharing in their giving toward those that are teaching and preaching to them. He says, goes back to the law and he says to them, don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. It's a metaphor. And then he goes on to say, did God mean that just for ox? Application, no to that answer, and yes, it's broader than that. So every metaphor is used to make what the application to be broader than that. So we come to 1 John chapter 2, and he begins to describe for us what happens when we apply truth to our lives. He begins to embellish. He begins to say pragmatically, this is what happens when you have a hunger for the word of God, it begins to change your life so much so that if you say that you know him, you ought to live in him and you must walk like him. With that being said, it not just affects your attitude about the truth, but it also begins to manifest itself in your affections toward those that are sitting next to you, toward your brothers and your sisters. You and I can't be coming out of darkness into the light and you hate the people that's coming out of darkness with you into the light and claim that you are in the light. He says, no, you are still in darkness. There is no way, there is no contradiction between experiencing the love of God for yourself and that love is being perfected in you that it does not affect no one else around you. That love is infectious. You can't keep it to yourself. As the old hymn writer said, I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just could not keep it to myself. So John begins to further embellish this whole issue about those that are born again, those that have been birthed in the family of God, therefore they're called children of God, born ones in God's family. This has nothing to do with the color of your skin or the kind of culture that you come from. His children are truly arrayed like a rainbow. Many colors, many kinds, different, many cultures. God did not just save one race. He's the God of the human race. Now, we, amen, you can say amen to that. I appreciate that. I really, really do. Um, so, let's be mindful now, this spiritual growth thing, this spiritual growth issue that John talks about is so important 
that he begins to describe it in verses 12 through 14 of 1 John chapter 2. He puts it in there because he wants us to know the normal process of spiritual development. The normal child-like development is a process and he is not damning or encouraging where you might be in your spiritual development. He, he gives us, as we saw last week, we didn't finish, but the first stage of spiritual development is described like the first stage of natural development. We change the process in the verses for clarity sake for the way that we think and how we think oftentimes it's it's it goes like this he says that when we are born in the family of God we are like children infants babies and he describes it and the way he describes it is in verse number 14 he I'm sorry verse 13 the C section of verse 13 he says I write to you dear children because you have known the father we're going to put about two, three dollars in the meter. So we're going to hang around here for a little bit. My sisters and my brothers, the true process of spiritual maturity is described as being like an infant, like a baby. And before some of you that are more mature or you have developed more, don't you ever look down on those that are babies, infants, children. And sometimes, you know, not Sharon, of course, but other churches, sometimes we disregard what are the benefits for a baby, about babies, and sometimes we disregard what the benefits that they receive for being what they are, a baby. Now I need to hasten to say this, that John gives us, and I'm going to share with you with other apostles that supplement and complement John on this area of being like a baby. It's crucial that we that may not be in the babyhood stage of our development, it's crucial that you and I, or some of us, one, don't disregard that stage. And two, in examining yourself, you might find yourself still in that stage. And with that being what it is, I want to talk about the normal stages of spiritual development and then I'm going to conclude with the abnormal stages of spiritual development and they both exist. So with that being the case, let's look at 
what is normal childhood? What's normal infancy? What is sane and sensical and sensible when it comes to this issue of infancy or infancy stages or childhood or being like a baby? First of all, we looked at briefly uh, last week that one thing about infants is that infants are limited in knowledge. Wake up and write it down. If they put it up, screenshot it, shoot it. The, the truth about being a baby, a child, and in the childhood stage of spiritual development is that infancy, when it comes to infancy, knowledge is limited. Meaning that there are some things that baby children, inf uh, infants, they don't know. But there is something that they do know. What babies, children, infants do know that when they are in that stage, they do know and get to know who their parents are. It's usually by the consistency of the presence of the parents and it's their ocular visual um, assessment of who these people are because they're around them a lot. And they begin to develop and understand that if I don't know nobody else or nothing else, I know who my parents are. Same in the spiritual realm. You, we, I did not, when I became born again, and I started out in the infancy stage of my salvific experience, if you would have asked me to explain the doctrine of repentance, I could not tell you. If you would ask me to explain justification, I could not tell you. If you would ask me to explain the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I could not tell you. If you would have asked me to explain the necessity and the um, benefits of praying, I couldn't tell you. I could probably tell you that I prayed and received the truth that I heard on that Sunday of June 2nd, 1974. I can tell you in praying my life and confessing with my life and my mouth and believing in my heart something took place in me. But if you would tell me, to, or if you would ask me to tell you what was entailed in that, what was all the details about prayer, what prayer is, how prayer works, what's the results of praying. I could not tell you, but it's one thing I could tell you, and it's one thing that I did know, and that is I met the Father, and it was because I have come to know the Son. And as a result of that, I knew and I came to know who my parent was, my brothers and sisters. Same with you, same with me. That's why John says, I write to you, little children, because you have come to know the Father. And in that stage, that's sufficient. Lord have mercy. 
So in infancy, in, in this area of babyhood or childhood, we must understand that um, babies are limited in knowledge, but they are sure and assured about what they do know. Lord have mercy. Need to say something else about this picture that John talks about and that Peter embellishes and adds to and supplements to. He says in so many words that the, the obvious thing too, have you ever noticed this? That infants, babies, children, they cause joy regardless of where they are or cause joy sometimes in spite of their circumstances even when it comes to those that are quote unquote adults in their lives. I know I'm right about this. And the reason why I know I'm right about this I've had the privilege and the honor, we've had the privilege and the honor to bring in this world four children. And in bringing into this world four children in their development, every last one of them caused us and our family to have a feeling of joy. I know it's not just exclusive to me. I know it's inclusive to you. Because every time I see an infant, a baby that's born, the first thing, one of the first things that y'all do is that you bring it around the family. And most of us I'm going to say all of us. I'm, I'm going to take them some stuff for granted. All of us, we, we oh, you can tell you, you precious. We change our language of how we talk to them as though they understand our gibberish. You know, they gibber, you know, they're making noise and sounds and all that. And we don't, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yes, I know, I understand what you are saying. Oh, look at that. Any little thing they do, oh, look at that baby. <laughs> oh, that baby. We gather around, we have, uh, 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 even prior to, we had baby showers with anticipation of. We, we, and after they're born, everybody be bringing stuff by, dropping them off. I thought that you might need this. I, I thought that you might have a need for this. And, and they be buying clothes and formula and all that. It just changes the atmosphere where it is normal that babies cause joy in families that have the privilege of doing so. So it is in the church. I'm telling you, my sisters and my brothers, the church's atmosphere should be excited and joyful when a baby is born and comes down the canal, birth canal of the aisle to let them know that I have been delivered and I am here and the atmosphere should be an atmosphere of excitement and not being dragged. Oh, okay, who this? I wonder who this is. I wonder why they coming. I wonder what problems they got. No, we ought to be just as joyous as when a natural baby is born. You and I should be like the family members doing invitation time like a family member in a waiting room. Lord have mercy. And they are pacing the floor back and forward and they are literally
literally those that even don't believe in God be praying that everything will come out all right. We as the church, the body of Christ, the family of God, when the invitation is brought forth, you ought not just be standing there looking around or standing there like this and not expecting nothing. Don't you know that there are birth pains that are taking place, contractions that are taking place that God is causing that individual to receive the seed, to accept the seed so that they can come forth with that seed and they can be children of God and we ought to be excited about that. Matter of fact, heaven is excited about that. The Bible says God of heaven, the angels rejoice when they see one come to repentance. <laughs> so just let me throw this in here since we're there. Whenever that takes place here, you that already that are born, you ought to be in praying mode. You ought to be praying and not looking around or standing up with no attitude of expectation. No, my sisters and my brothers, we ought to, you ought to, we all ought to, I ought to be in praying mode. And praying mode is equal to a woman pushing, doing a contraction. You and I need to push. That means pray, 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 pray that everything will come out. All right. Babies, infants, infants, children, they cause joy. They not only cause joy, but infants and children and babies, they need pediatrics. And they need for people, doctors, obstetricians, pediatrics, pediatrics, <laughs> podiatrists, you know, pediatrics. They, they, they need, they need, they need, they need that as children for their normal development. They need pre and post care. Lord have mercy. Now, now, I'm telling you, this is what comprises and this is what the scriptures embellish about this whole issue of childhood, babies, infancy, stage of spiritual development. They, they need care so that in their development process, they, they need it pre-post to make sure that they are developing in a normal, proper sense. Application. The church, we need to become spiritual pediatric. Pe 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 Pediatricians. That's part of your mind slipping these days. Your mouth can't catch up with your mind. <laughs> Pediatricians. And we need to be in a pediatrician business, Sharon. And what pediatricians do is that they give them the necessary vitamins, the necessary care that they need so that they can develop, so that they can grow. And so that's why I'm just giving you a little hint and to show you that we are spiritual pediatricians is that we have different ministries to help them to develop when they come as being new babies in the church. That's why we have rooted and grounded. That's why we have women's ministry, men's ministry. That's why we have different feeding ministries spiritually so that they can develop. So we as spiritual pediatricians, we need to look out for our babies. 
Don't disdain, don't be disdained with them. Don't be disappointed in them because they're not doing what you do at the spiritual development stage that you are in. Don't get spiritual amnesia like you did not start out there. And that's one of the problems that we have in the body of Christ and the family of God is that we get spiritual amnesia when we deal with people that may not be where we are. And we look at them like, what is wrong with you? And we say stuff like this. There's something wrong with this church or something wrong. Well, who is it that you are dealing with? Are you dealing with somebody that's new in the faith? Are you dealing with somebody that's a little bit more mature in the faith? Are you dealing with somebody that may not be as mature as you might be? And whatever phase and stages they're in, you need, we need, all of us need to treat them as what they are, not as what they are going to become. I think one of the most devastating things in any church is that we abuse our babies. We talk to them anyway. We treat them anyway. You know, we act out in front of them anyway. And, and they look at that and they say in their limited knowledge, is that what I'm going to become? Is that how I'm going to develop when I get that age spiritually? I say that to say this. Always treat people as if they are babies because you never know if they are or if they're not especially new I know we got three calls those that need to know Christ those that need to return to Christ those that need to become a part of the body of Christ even those that are becoming a part of the body of Christ, even those that may be returning to Christ, they may still be in the stage of infancy. Babyhood. Childhood. And you know how we treat our children? Delicately. We are focused on what they need and that goes to the next point and that is babies also are in a perpetual state of discontent what do you mean they are babies are never satisfied in where they are and what they are experiencing what do you mean by that gosh y'all making me work hard What I mean by that is you can't shut a baby's mouth when they're hungry. They're discontent in the state that they are in. As a matter of fact, that's proof that you are a baby. And not only in babyhood, there's a level of discontentment. It's also in young adult and adult. Otherwise, you, you are never satisfied with where you are spiritually. So when they get discontent, they, they discontent for one or two reasons. And that is they're hungry They're laying in a mess. Watch this. Or they're sick. You don't ever want a non-crying baby. Because if the baby is non-crying, there's something wrong with that baby. Because that's not the normal stages of what a baby does. 
So if you flip it spiritually in application, if you are not satisfied in the truth that you are getting, that means you want more truth. That's what Peter meant when he wrote as a baby, like a baby, watch this. Like my fact, let's turn to it real quick. First Peter, he says this in First Peter chapter two. He says, like a newborn baby craves the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So babies, they just have a craving to be fed. That's the new nature in the baby, or in us as spiritual babies. We have a desire to eat like a natural baby does. You don't feed a baby once a day. You don't feed a baby once a week. You don't feed a baby once a month. You feed a baby two, three, four times a day until that appetite and that desire is quenched, till that hunger is quenched. That's when you feed a baby. That's proof that you have a normal baby or that you are in the normal stage of infancy. You want more. You are not content with what you have or what you get. You want more of what you get. Here's the other thing that I thought about this and I think it was illuminated to me that the mother has everything that that child needs in her milk. There are no other supplements that's needed to help that child grow except that milk. They don't need no other stuff, no other kinds of stuff. Everything is in that milk to satisfy the cravings of that baby. That's why Peter said you grow by the crave, the sincere, the pure milk of God's word. Meaning this, when you are a child of God, you don't need no other kinds of supplements to help you grow spiritually. You might need supplements to help you grow physically. You might work out and go to the gym and all that kind of stuff, but you need food to help you energize you so that you can have strength to do that so it is in the spiritual realm. The child of God does not need other supplements to help them grow spiritually. You don't need Newsweek. You don't need social media to grow spiritually. You don't need that kind of stuff. God wants you and I to make him our bestie. Meaning this, he wants you and I to hang around with him. Lord have mercy. If we're going to grow, he wants you and I that we spend so much time together that we vibe off of each other and we will do what God asks us to do. Listen to me, my sisters and my brothers. You can't get your prayer answered by going through social media platforms and asking them what you think about me. Can you give me a like? Look, there are people that are viewing you don't like you. So is that going to cause you to stop doing what you're doing? That's why you don't depend on them to validate who you are. You get with your bestie, God, and you spend time with him and you ask him, Lord, how am I doing? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be be acceptable in your sight that you give me a thumbs up. to let me know how I'm doing. (laughs) Gotta hurry up. Just let me give you, let me, let me, let me give you some necessities for growth of a baby. Normal growth. Normal growth. Real quick, I'm gonna run through these real quick. But screenshot it. I'll write it down. 
And for babies to grow, it's a necessity that they get food. Ooh, I'm deep, man. That's real deep. We saw the passage, we looked at the passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 where he says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of God's word. Don't taint it with nothing else. Drink the sincere milk of the word of God. No, 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 don't supplement it with some outside garbage that'll stop your spiritual maturity. Uh, no, get the sincere milk. Don't adulterate it. D don't pollute it with other entities and other what you call supplements that will make you a more rounded Christian. No, everything you need is in the milk of God's word. Everything I need, we need, us, we need is in the milk, the sincere milk, the pure milk of God's word. And, and listen to me, if you have a problem, Lord have mercy, if you have a problem that you no longer or you don't have an appetite for the word of God, it may be you have been feeding off of junk food. Okay, I, I ain't making this up. Go, I, I go back to 1 Peter. Now, now remember 1 Peter chapter 2. He talks about this. In verse 2, he says, like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation, right? Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. The milk is good. He's good. That's the pure milk of the word. But before he said that, this may be the reason why you're not growing. Go to verse 1. And verse 1 says, therefore, get rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Then he says, like, a what? You missed it, didn't you? Yeah. He says, if you're going to be like a newborn baby, you got to get some stuff out of your life. And the stuff that you need to get out of your life, get rid of, is all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. If you don't get that out of your life, you can't be like a newborn baby. So a Christian, a believer, can't have unconfessed sin, no convictions about the stuff that you used to do, or convictions about the stuff that you do do, because you don't think that what you do do is anything wrong of what, what you do. But the problem is this, the reason why you don't have an appetite for the sincere milk of the word is because you got all these other things you are eating that fills up it's non-substantive stuff that you have in your life. It's like having a whole box of donuts and you eat donuts and then when it comes time to get the meal or the nourishment that you need, you are limited on your intake because of the junk that you have eaten that has nothing to do with your maturation. So get that out of our lives. Then you might develop a palate for that which is pure, nutritional, and it causes you to grow. I'm going to say this because I'm running out of time but not out of truth. A, a baby, a baby, a baby. A baby, hopefully I'll come back to it. I can remember. A baby needs food. A baby also needs air, oxygen to mature. 
cut a baby's oxygen, I tell you what they're going to do. They're going to die. Oxygen to the baby, to the child of God, is equal to prayer. That may be natural and normal for a baby to have oxygen to live. The spiritual baby needs oxygen, and that's interpreted in application by prayer. The scripture says this in Thessalonians chapter 5. Watch this. Pray without ceasing. I think I shared this with you before. You might have forgotten, and if you haven't, act like you did forget. Act like this is the first time you heard this. Take that verse and take out prayer and put breathe or oxygen. Breathe without ceasing. You tell me I'm trying. I'm trying. I really am. I'm trying. Thank you for your encouragement. I'm trying. If, if, you, if you can't not breathe and live, you cannot breathe and grow. Listen, you cannot pray and live. You cannot pray and grow. Prayer is a necessity for your spiritual maturity. So the question that Paul is saying, he's not saying you got to be getting down on your knees and praying and all that kind of closing your eyes in the corner somewhere. No, you need to watch and pray. So while your eyes are open, while you're driving down the road, while you're walking, while you're on scepter, while you're in your vehicle, while you're on a treadmill, you ought to be praying without ceasing because it's like having oxygen. And if I don't have oxygen, I'm not going to exist and live. And if I don't have prayer, we don't have prayer in our lives as it being daily and consistent and constant. We are not going to live. We need the word of God. We need oxygen. We need prayer to grow. Here it is. We need exercise to grow. There's in the scripture that says to us that we need to exercise our faith, meaning putting it into practice. Listen, don't sit around and be a spiritual lump on a log because you ain't exercising. And what I mean by that is that you're not doing nothing for the Lord. Get some exercise in. Do something for him. Join the ministry. Be a part of a ministry. That's exercising your faith. Y'all not talking back to me. It's that is what causes uh, us to grow. L last but not least, but I need to say this too, and that fourthly, what, what's, in, what's the necessity for a baby to grow is a baby must have proper, must have a proper atmosphere. Oh, oh yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. I don't mean no harm. None of our children that, if that, if that Sister Reed birthed, I did not birth the baby. I can only relate to the pain that she was experiencing. I can only try to be supportive to the pain that she had experienced. And sometimes some of you gentlemen, you know, you can't, regardless of what you say, <laughs> but the pain that they go through, sometimes they'll put it on you. They'll look at you, you did this to me. <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> my, my, my point is, my sisters and my brothers, when, when, when any of our children are born, we, we don't just lay them on the table and put them in that little incubator, uh, little cage glass thing, and, and just leave them there and like, all right. Call us when you're ready to go home. Or, or you don't, or you don't, or you don't, you don't put them, you don't take them home, put them on a the porch, and say, when you're ready to come in, let us know. We'll bring, 
bring you in to the house. No, no, no. They would either freeze or dehydrate. It depended on the weather. No, what you do, you bring them in an atmosphere that's conducive for them to grow. I'm going to say this to you. And I know I'm two minutes past the time that y'all gave me. Well, y'all was five minutes past the time that y'all was supposed to do what y'all doing. So just give me a little bit more minutes. I'm going to use some pastoral prerogative <laughs> at this point. Here, here it is. Here it is. No, no, you bring them in an atmosphere that bolsters their growth. And I say this to you in all sincerity. This is the normal process of spiritual maturity that causes spiritual maturity. And that is this. We need to be, and I, I believe we are, I really do. And I'm not saying this for bragging purposes. I'm saying this for biblical purposes that if you can't grow here, listen to me, hear me out. Because of the atmosphere and what's in place, maybe the reason why you aren't growing is because you're not availing yourself. To the atmosphere that has been set for you to grow. Now, I'm going to say this and I'm closing. I'm done. And that is this. I know some of y'all saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Here it is. Just as there is normal phases and stages of growth that babies go through. There is also abnormal things that take place that stunt the normality of a way a baby should grow, of the way a baby should grow. There was a church in Paul's day. Watch this. They had all the gifts. They lacked in no gift. No spiritual gift. They had spiritual pediatricians in their lives. And they misused that. But yet they thought that they were more, better, more mature than anybody else. But Paul says, they are not. You are not. You are stunted. No, you get that from Turn with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. After Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For Romans is Acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says this about this church and he throws in something there that's mind-blowing about the abnormal birth of God's children. He says in verse 1 of chapter 3, I'm reading from the NIV version of Holy Writ. He says, brothers, I cannot address you as spiritual but as worldly or carnal, as worldly, mere, watch this, infants in Christ, babes in Christ. Watch this, look at this. I gave you milk and not solid food, for you were not yet ready or able or you're not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Why? You are still worldly. You're still carnal. Here's the proof of your immaturity and abnormal development. For since there is jealousy, quarreling among you, are you not carnal 
worldly, immature, undeveloped? Are you not acting like mere men, unsaved people? For when one says, I follow Paul, another says, I follow Apostle, are you not like mere ungodly, carnal men, worldly men and women? What, 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 I got to stop right there. It's my time. So li, li, listen. This is, what he, this is what he was describing. Can you imagine that in one of our hospitals, in the delivery section, in the infant section of our hospitals, you get in a tour and you say, these are our babies that are here. This is our, you know, infancy, you know, ward. These are all the infants that are born. And then you walk down a little further and he says, and, and, and these are those that um, they love this so much to be here that they decided not to leave. And you got nurses holding 14, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 year olders, 60 year olders in their hand, in their arm. If you see that, if I saw something like that, I would say, this is ridiculous. You mean to tell me that they are still here? Still in the state of babyhood? That's what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians. You are still babies. I fed you with spiritual food, I mean spiritual milk. I couldn't give you no meat because you was acting like you wasn't cutting no teeth. And because you didn't have no spiritual teeth, I wasn't going to do that because I would have gagged you. And you may have choked. And we've got people in the church that's been here 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years, almost the years as the age of this church and have not moved out of spiritual infancy stages and they swear that they're grown because of their age. Age does not guarantee spiritual maturity. So babies, keep on feeding, keep on craving, keep on exercising, keep on doing what's necessary to cause your spiritual maturity to take place and keep on talking to the Father. Keep on having daily deliberate conversation with the Father. Keep on breathing, inhaling, exhaling when it comes to prayer and naturally you don't have to think about breathing. You ought not be having to think about praying. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your struggles. He'll hear your humble cry. He'll answer by and by. Feel the little prayer wheel turning feel a little fire burning have a little talk with Jesus he'll make everything all right be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that pass of all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus what a friend we have in Jesus Jesus, all our griefs and just burdens the bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If you withdraw yourself from me, where shall I go? Tell him, talk to him, share with him everything in prayer and watch you grow. (laughs) 
There may be somebody here. Who have been just born in the family of God. Somebody here that's just coming down the canal. And we as family members, what are we doing right now? 